Hi, it's Dr. Ogden. In this lecture, we're going to be learning a little bit more about DNA technology. This lecture could be really extensive with lots of different things, but we're just going to choose a few things and look at them. So recall that this is the genetic code, and that the genetic code is shared among all organisms. There's a few exceptions and a few changes in some instances, but for the most part, this genetic code is the same for all organisms. And what that means then is that, you know, you can take the gene for glowing, for bioluminescence from a jellyfish, and you can basically introduce that gene into genetically engineered bunnies or, or rats, and they will essentially glow in the dark. Now, the way that this is done is through a DNA technology called recombinant DNA technology. This is a set of techniques where you combine genes from different sources into one DNA molecule, right? So any organism that has DNA from recombinant um, DNA uh, from a, a combined DNA molecule is, is called a genetically modified organism. Recombinant DNA technology then is becoming a very rapidly um, progressing field in biotechnology. And so we use this in biotechnology to perform lots of different tasks. So here's just a couple examples. So we could take uh, a gene of interest from an organism, perhaps it's a human or whatever, and then we take a host cell's DNA, uh, usually this is a bacteria, and we insert the gene of interest into the bacteria. Then we allow the bacteria to either uh, go through um, and um, go through cellular division and make lots of copies of itself, or you allow the bacteria to then make the products that this gene would be making. And you can then, with that, once you have all of that together, you could just take the genes themselves, and then they can be inserted into other organisms through different methods. You could use the bacteria themselves to go in and clean up, you know, for example, an oil spill. If the gene here was a gene that was used to process oil, to um, break down oil. Uh, you could use the products of the genes, so like the proteins here or the enzymes. And this is one of the ways that now genes are stone washed. They're not actually washed with stones anymore. Or you could potentially use the, that protein or the product that is being produced and it could be harvested and filtered in such a way that it could be then part of a drug that could be used. For example, the, it might be a protein that's used to dissolve um, blood clots, and so it could be a heart attack therapy um, medicine. So lots of different things that, that could be done. Now, the techniques then that are being used are really quite amazing, and bacteria end up being the workhorses of everything that we do. Now, to work with the genes in the laboratory, we had to come up with ways to get genes in and out of organisms. And one of the one of the most common methods that this is done is through the use of plasmids. Now, I haven't talked about plasmids before, but plasmids are small pieces of circular DNA. So here are, is an example of a plasmid. And notice it's just sitting off to the side. You can see in this picture here that here's a, a plasmid that's sitting off to the side. Here's another one, right? And they're not connected to the entire circular um, bacterial genome. They're, they're these little singular pieces, circular pieces of, of DNA off to the side. And we can take advantage of the fact that bacteria readily take up these plasmids into their cells, and then any DNA that is in that plasmid that could be read and could be um, transcribed to make an RM mRNA and then eventually translated to make some protein product that that's how we can get gels of in, or I'm sorry genes of interest inside of a bacteria and have the bacteria then use that gene. So um, plasmids end up being vectors to get the the uh, gene of interest inside of the bacteria. So here's here's a more detailed way of the, the way that this happens. So here's our bacteria cell and this plasmid, um, and you can take. DNA from, for example, a human cell, you can chop the DNA up into fragments and, and then you take these plasmids and you chop them, you don't chop them up, but you uh, cut them so that now they have these little sticky ends. And then you can paste or splice these chopped up DNA fragments into each of the plasmids. 
Notice that the yellow one actually does have a gene on it, but as we know, a lot of human DNA doesn't have genes. It just has, you know, DNA that, that doesn't necessarily have a gene that, that, ha that works. And so a lot of the DNA, like the purple strand or the green strand, may just be introduced into a plasmid but doesn't do anything. Then you grow up the bacteria, clones, and you end up with now um, multiple, multiple bacteria that all have these clone, these uh, copies, right, of each of these um, p stretches of DNA that came originally from a human chromosome. And then what you find out is that, you know, a lot of them are dead ends or duds, but every once in a while you get one that you say, oh, that actually had a gene inside of it, and that gene produces this protein, you know, this protein V in this case. And so this is a way where you kind of shotgun approach. You, you just take lots of DNA, put them in lots of these um, plasmid vectors, grow them all up on, as different clones, and then you see what they're making. Now, the way that, the, um, that you can actually cut and then paste together are with some molecular tools called restriction enzymes. And so the restriction enzyme cuts this and then comes in and pastes the um, DNA together. And the, the, the molecule that does the pasting is called DNA ligase. Um, so we have a ligase that comes in here and does this and, and pastes these things together. Notice the way that it does this, though. If you look at this, it's G-A-A-T-T-C. And if you go in the reverse direction on the strand, G-A-A-T-T-C. So it's like a palindrome, a DNA palindrome. And that's where restriction enzymes cut. And so when you want to include a piece of DNA into this, you simply just add that same palindrome on the end, and then that gets included in there with the gene of interest being on the inside. And so finally now, ligase brings it all together, and now you have the recombinant DNA molecule. So the, one of the very first uh, genetically modified products was a pharmaceutical product called Humulin. And this product is human insulin, but that was produced by bacteria. So once again, the gene for insulin in humans was taken out of humans, was spliced into one of these plasmids in a bacteria, and then that bacteria has grown up and grown up and, gro and grown. And then you basically just purify the product of insulin, stick it in a saline solution, and there you go. You have now humulin which can then be used by diabetics. Now, the other thing that's been happening is foods have been getting genetically modified. So we've been modifying plants. Um, and this is really replacing kind of plant breeding programs. You know, in the old days, you had artificial selection. The farmer would go out and find, you know, the apple trees that were producing the best, uh, sweetest, biggest apples, you know, with maybe the really red, red skin because those sold better at the market. And so farmers would quickly find those apples, let those seeds be the one that are, ger that are germinated and then um, um, produce the new apple trees. And you do that over successive generations and pretty soon you've got all of your orchard is now this red, sweet, you know, large apple. But now we can actually go in and start changing the genetics in one generation. We don't have to go through this process of selective um, breeding. And and so now, like 93% of soybean crops are genetically modified, 93% of cotton, 86% of corn, 95% of sugar beets. So a large proportion of all of the crops that are grown are genetically modified. Now, one of the examples that I really like is corn. Okay? Now, corn used to be infested by this uh, caterpillar here, which is a moth caterpillar called the European corn borer. And the damage was quite extensive. It turns out, though, that the European corn borer has a hard time eating some types of plants. And these plants produce toxins and chemicals. And so what was, what the, what was done was they, the gene was, was discovered that produces these toxins and chemicals that this caterpillar does not like to eat and that eventually can kill this caterpillar. Those genes were introduced into the corn genome, and now you have corn that produces corn, but also produces these chemicals and toxins. Now, as far as we can tell, and lots of testing was done, these chemicals and toxins have no effect on humans, but they do have the effect on the um, European corn borer. Another interesting example was what was called golden rice. 
Golden rice is rice that is genetically modified to contain beta carotene, and beta carotene is one of these products that's used to make vitamin A. Well, around the world, millions of children buy, die every year because of vitamin A deficiency. So the idea was, let's make rice that has this beta carotene so that they don't suffer from vitamin A deficiency. And it seems like a great idea because the areas of the world where these where people are dying from um, from this deficiency is also areas where mostly rice is eaten, right, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But an interesting thing happened. Ten years after its development, it's still not being produced and, and distributed. And why? Well, you get opposition to these genetically modified organisms some, by organiz, organizations, sometimes like Greenpeace or other opposition from government or whatever. And so the company that had the patent on this eventually gave up and they said, there's no money in this. So others have kind of taken this up and golden rice is still being studied and maybe it will be on the market. Um, you know, so like World Food Day is looking into this. But you know, in the meantime, don't, don't expect to see it anytime soon. So there are concerns about genetically modified organisms. You know, some of these concerns are that you might be creating these super weeds you know, that, that resist all herbicides. Or you might, um, the products of genetically engineered crops may be hurting um, um, other species. So maybe we've tested it on humans, but, and it's not hurting humans, but maybe it is hurting other species. And an example of this is actually with that BT corn, where it's tur it turns out that this has affected populations of the monarch butterfly. So yeah, there's concerns, and, and we probably ought to be cautious about the way we go about this, but genetically modifying our um, foods is, is really you know, the way that most of the, our foods are, are going, and that's the way that it's going to be in the future.